Hey everyone, welcome back. Um, so we're just going to go straight into our next speaker. So our next speaker is the University of Liverpool's very own da Dr. David McNamara. His talk will be on the role for geol geologists in changing our energy sector. Thank you so much, uh, Meg and Jade, for having me and for introducing me. Can everyone see my screen okay now? Yeah. Oh, hang on. I'm not going to click the share button, I guess. Can everyone see that? Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Um, thank you so much to the Herman Society for inviting me along to be one of the speakers at the symposium this year. Uh, this is kind of special for me because I did my PhD some little years ago in um, the University of Liverpool and attending the symposium was always one of the highlights of the sort of social calendar of the University of Liverpool um, year. So it's really, really special to be able to come back and be a presenter at one of these. And I really love the topic of this year's, um, of this year's uh, symposium as well, this dynamic um, earth topic. And I hope that I can sort of get across sort of what I'm talking about today in, in, inside that kind of theme. Um, you know, for, I, I work a lot as a, as a geologist in um, many different spaces, and one of those is the energy sector and, and the geologist's role in, in the energy sector. And the energy sector, the global energy sector, is in quite a phase of uh, quite a dynamic phase these days. Um, you'll all be familiar with words like decarbonization, uh, net zero. Um, and uh, energy transition and, and all of those words imply this move or change in the energy sector as we try to become um, more environmental so we can you know help the energy sector address its contributions and increase our ability to deal with things like the climate crisis that we're currently in so th th for me this feels like such an appropriate um, topic for this concept of, of our dynamic earth because it's such a dynamic field these days uh, so what I've sort of decided I would talk about, um, uh, given that I think most of um, our audience are basically the future of, of, of geoscience, is kind of, um, it's kind of a pitch to you and to the existing established geologists that might be listening as well. It's a pitch for you to think about um, how you can become a geothermal geologist and what your potential role, and to show you maybe a little bit about what your potential role could be in helping deal with big, big, big concepts like the energy transition and, and net zero and, and things like that. Um, so in one way, it's, it's my pitch to you. And in another way, um, because I love geothermal uh, so much, this is kind of my love letter to geothermal itself as well. So I hope you enjoy this talk. So I think any talk that starts, any talk that is dealing with um, anything to do with energy, I think it's really important to frame that concept of energy. And, um, and I will apologize for some of these slides in advance because I know a number of this audience may have already seen them. I've kind of been doing the talk rounds as they say. So hopefully people aren't too bored with what I'm presenting here. But I think it's really important that we frame energy as more than just electricity. Um, energy, of course, is about the power that we use to turn our computers, our TVs, the lights at home, um, and, and that. But it's it's what it's very much more. Energy is a energy is intrinsically and intimately interwoven into absolutely everything in our society and in our modern day way of life. You know, we need energy for heating and cooling. We need it for manufacturing and industrial use. So, you know, the clothes you're wearing, the furniture you're sitting on, all of that needs energy to get the materials for it and to put those materials together into the final products. Um, the food we eat, the water we drink, all of it requires energy, so it's a huge thing in agriculture. And obviously our ability to just travel around and, and get from place to place. So whether that transport is public, private or commercial, it all requires energy. So energy is an absolutely essential component of modern society, which is what makes it such an important um, space for people to be constantly advancing and working on. So I, I, it's always good as well to frame this in terms of how we how we work with energy at home. So this is just a little graph of UK energy consumption using data from the government websites. And I've got it here from about 1970 to 2018. I haven't got the last few years in there. And, uh, and there's lots of ways of measuring um, energy usage. Um, you can see in the, on the graph here on the y-axis, this is measured in this uh, terms in MTOE, which basically stands for millions of million tons of oil equivalent. So if you think one of those is roughly equivalent to something like nearly 12 million megawatt hours. So it's quite a lot of energy. One MTOE is quite a lot of energy. And when you look at the UK's energy use across the last nearly 50 years, we haven't really changed a lot in how much energy we use. We're still kind of roughly around this 140 MTOE energy per year. 
in terms of our usage. What has changed really over the last 40 to 50 years is the sectors that we are using it in. So if you look at the blue at the bottom here, this is actually showing a, a rapid quite a rapid but steady decrease in industrial use of energy in the UK, a huge increase in transport energy. So we're using a lot more energy for transport. We're seeing a slow increase in domestic uh, use of energy. So that would be things like our home electricity, our heating, for example, cooking, that all comes through here in this purple. And then actually our, our services, so things like schools, hospitals, uh, shops, uh, uh, shopping centers, that kind of thing, has been actually fairly consistent um, over the last um, 40 years or so. So our energy sectors are slightly changing, more transport, more domestic use. Um, and again, that's a good, uh, it's a good thing to be able to recognize this because now we know where to focus our efforts to change um, the ways energy is used in those sectors. Um, and just to put the domestic one into, into a bit more of um, context for you as well, you know, the average household in UK uses something like 20 megawatt hours per year, and there's about 29 million households in the UK. And you can just sort of see how that stacks up against this one million ton uh, of oil equivalent, which is you know, 11.63 million megawatts. So, you know, where the, the household use is not an insignificant use in terms of energy. So thinking about now having that sort of nice wide picture of energy uses, now it's good to think about our energy sources. And again, this is kind of where the geoscience starts and the earth science starts to come into it. And I like to think about energy sources in three major uh, sort of categories. So in this blue sort of uh, category down in the bottom corner here, this is our non-renewable resources. And that includes everything from coal to oil and gas to peat and our nuclear resources as well. Those are not renewable. We, are, we have to utilize those and, and, and exhaust them and to create energy. And then we can go to the other end of that spectrum and we can think about renewable energy resources. And that would include things like wind, solar, tidal, hydroelectricity. And then I have a category that I can, and, and a lot of people would debate and disagree with this, but I have a category that I kind of don't put into either. And, and I've put two, and this is this top corner here in the sort of orange box. These are categories that I refer to as sustainable energy resources. They're neither exhaustible, but nor are they renewable, depending very much on how they're used and managed as we operate them. And that includes things like biomass for energy and also geothermal energy. I consider geothermal, geothermal energy not to be a renewable, green source, uh, a renewable energy source. It is a green energy resource, but it is a sustainable one because if you operate it um, uh, too much, if you operate it in the wrong way, you can actually reduce the effectiveness of it and you can even kill geothermal resources within uh, proper management and operation. So they're all about sustainable energy resources and I, I include biomass and geothermal in there. So again, let's put it in the UK context. What is our energy sources in the UK? We know where we're using it, but where is it coming from? So you can see from this graph here, and again, we're going from 1970 to about 2018, uh, our UK energy sources have changed quite a lot over time. Now we're still predominantly relying on fossil fuels. And again, the measurements on the side here are MTOE, and here's our 140 mark along the top. You know, all of this, uh, all of these gray colors and a bit of brown at the bottom, this is our uh, non-renewable resource, even the pink actually, because that's our nuclear. This is our non-renewable uh, energy sources. And they make up by far the majority of our energy sources here in the UK. We still are hugely reliant on oil and gas, which are these two blocks here, the dark and the light gray. Um, our nuclear has decreased over time. We had a bit of a, a, a period uh, during the 90s where we've seen a large increase in the amount of production of energy from nuclear. And what you're seeing at the top here, maybe starting somewhere back in the late 80s, is this growth of this yellow and green bar. And these are, the yellow is our bioenergy. So that's, um, that's the energy we are using for um, everything from fuels created from uh, biomass, like rapeseed, for example. And then our green here is what would be considered our renewables. And that's mostly in the UK down to solar and wind, which are growing quite a lot, especially um, since 2010, actually seeing a rapid growth in, in, in the contribution to our energy supply from those two sources. But there, inside that, when you break down that renewable one, that's the dominant uh, pairing, it's solar and wind. What we're seeing not very well developed or not utilized really at all in the UK are things like geothermal energy, tidal energy, hydro energy, that kind of thing. So with that said, I want to think a little bit about geothermal and why we're not using it in the UK, where we could potentially go with it in the UK, and what can we use it for. 
And something I think is always quite surprising to a number of people when you talk about geothermal energy is the variety of use that you can have with geothermal energy. So yes, we can use it for electricity generation. Um, we've been doing that since the 1960s. We, the first country to start doing this was Italy, um, New Zealand following very quickly after it. And so there are a lot of countries around the world now actively producing electricity um, and baseload electricity supply from geothermal resources. Um, coming down from that a little bit, again, we can use geothermal for district heating and cooling. So that means we can use geothermal power and geothermal fluids to heat large sections of cities. We can use it to heat government buildings. Uh, we can use it to heat um, hospitals. We can use it to heat entire um, housing, um, housing districts, for example, as well. So there is a huge element of uh, geothermal that can be wrapped up in the healing, or sorry, in the heating and cooling aspect of energy. It's not just about electricity production. Then you can have individual home heating and cooling systems that would be things like ground source heat pumps. These are geothermal energy sources as well. And then coming away from even this concept of using it for electricity and using it for heating and cooling, we can also apply geothermal energy to tackle other sectors that use a lot of energy. So uh, agriculture being a huge one in particular. So we can use geothermal heat um, from the ground to do things like timber drying, and it's used extensively around the world in um, in agriculture, so thermoculture. So anything from green, heating greenhouses to heating pools where we can grow very specific types of, um, of seafood and shellfish and, and just for growing a lot of food in general. And then there are smaller, but also still quite important uses of geothermal things like um, tourism and well-being, So bat bathing and swimming pools and heated pools. And uh, you know, I'm sure this might be quite important to a number of our audience here. The brewing industry as well needs a lot of energy and heat too. And that can be done with geothermal. And we're seeing an uptake of that in countries that are getting really into um, craft beers. So it would be great to see more of that in the UK, I think. So there's such a wide, wide range of places that we can use geothermal energy. And I think that's something that's important to keep in mind as we in the UK move forward to diversifying our energy sources and trying to decarbonize, because geothermal could potentially be a really um, useful step for us to take and a useful place for us to develop. To kind of give that a bit of context in terms of use, it really comes down to how hot we can get the geothermal fluids to. So what you can use it for depends very much on the temperatures you have available to you. So, I mean, if you look at the top end of this spectrum here, um, let's see if I can, yeah, this may help. If you look at the top end of the spectrum here, we've got um, you know, electricity generation, either through conventional geothermal methods or through binary plants, for example. And you need temperatures that are quite high in subsurface. You need it's something like over 110, generally over 110 or more to really get electricity production um, out of a geothermal resource. And when you think about that in terms of the UK, that might be quite difficult, particularly if we're only able to really you know, um, feasibly get to depths of two to three kilometers in the crust. We're never, except for maybe some very specific places going to get temperatures high enough um, under our subsurface in the UK to generate electricity. But that's fine because when we come down to the other major uses of geothermal energy down here, so agriculture, heat production, district heating, um, home heating, that kind of thing, we see that the temperatures, are, the temperature requirements are now much lower. And you can do a lot with 20 degree fluid and you can do a lot with you know, fluids that are getting up to 100, that 100 degree mark. And there are plenty of places in the UK where we think we can get these types of geothermal temperatures. So there's plenty of room to develop this type of geothermal energy use here at home. And it's not exactly that geothermal is new to the UK. And um, we've actually been doing it for a lot longer than many, many places around the world. Um, for example, the main example I could think of for this is, um, for UK geothermal use, is the hot spring in Bath. This was the site of a, of a Roman bath, it was important. They were using um, natural water temperatures that range somewhere between 70 to uh, 90 odd degrees um, as uh, part of their, um, their bathing culture. And it was used by Romans actually up until about the fifth century when um, the, the, the empire collapsed and they left the country. And, uh, but it was then redeveloped a few times during the Middle Ages as well. So there's this constant use of geothermal for uh, recreational purposes and, and, um, and well-being purposes for a long time. And even today, it these, these baths exist in Bath as a geothermal tourist site. We actually have geothermal tourism here in the UK. Now, the traditional baths are no longer used um, uh, because the waters aren't particularly safe from what I understand, but they have created new modern baths using new wells that were drilled into geothermal waters. So we have 
geothermal tourism and geothermal use for things like bathing already in place in the UK. And this isn't the only place that this could be happen. This could happen. There are a number of hot springs and warm springs across the UK. Um, and I know they're developing another one, for example, in Cornwall, um, that's going to have a, a geothermal source for heating um, its, its bathing facilities. So it could be a growing industry for us. If we kind of you know, step back and think, okay, what about uh, large scale or even home scale heating and cooling? Um, this has been discussed in the UK for a long time. It's actually been looked at since around about the 1980s. And this is um, looking at the potential of developing a particular, um, a particular set of lithologies within our subsurface, the permatrassic sandstones as geothermal resources. Investigation of them over the last um, 30 to 40 years shows that they do have decent temperatures at depths that are accessible to us by um, our usual sort of drilling techniques that can generate uh, district heating level um, energy sources or even um, provide decent um, uh, sources for things like uh, heating your own home. So there is a huge potential in large areas of England and Northern Ireland to access the hotter geothermal fluid that exists within some of these units. And this is something that's been looked at quite a lot by both the Northern Irish government and the UK as part of its um, new plans to help decarbonize our energy sector here at home. Finally, I guess, is the, the sort of holy grail of geothermal is, okay, can we produce electricity from it? And in the UK, we're, we're even looking at this now as well. And I, there's two, one place in particular, um, which is the Cornwall region of, of, of South West England. And we have the, the United Downs drilling project that's occurring down there. And we followed up very soon this year by the Eden project. And they are drilling wells into very localized high temperature subsurface uh, 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 bodies of rock to find temperatures that are hot enough to actually produce electricity. And they're predicting things like, I think this uh, value has actually gone up, this one megawatt electricity value here has actually gone up to something like three megawatt now, but this can heat thousands of homes in this region just by, uh, or sorry, power, uh, not heat, power, um, provide electricity for 1500 homes in this region, probably a lot more. Um, and there's also areas across uh, the UK that are investigating old mine workings, which have a lot of hot fluids um, within those that might be tapped into to produce a lot of the district level heating. So geothermal is very much alive in the UK, but it is in a phase now that requires a lot of investment from the geoscientific community, a lot of investment from and encouragement from government in order to get the industry to really buy into this as uh, that the UK is going to be a country that is going to value and use this energy resource. So there's something marketable there. So that, that kind of gives you a flavor of where we might be going with geothermal in the UK. And these uh, these isolated spots here, like um, like in Cornwall, for example, there are more of these across the UK. We have granites buried in a number of different locations across the UK. I know the Moor Mountains, for example, in Northern Ireland has been investigated and is of, an in, and is of interest. And we also have a number of um, intrusive bodies in Scotland that might be worth looking at for this type of energy production too. So there's lots of scope for thinking about how UK geology can be better utilized to decarbonize and, and, and pull the UK through the energy transition. So with that kind of in mind, I guess the next thing I want to talk to you about here is um, how can we as geologists and how can you as the upcoming uh, future of geology or earth, sciences, or earth scientists contribute to this development of this energy resource? How can you work in the geothermal sector to make it a real, uh, to, to realize it as, as a future um, uh, powerhouse of energy production? And there's a few, and in my career working in geothermal, you know, I left, um, my PhD in Liverpool in about 2009 and started working in New Zealand in the geothermal sector where I've, I worked there for maybe eight years and I've been now doing geothermal research and consultancy work in various parts of the globe um, since then as well. And I guess some of the main sort of points I've learned from my career in geothermal geology is that um, if you're going to be a, an earth scientist or a geologist in, in the geothermal sector, you can specialize and focus on one data type and, and see how that and work with that data type or that technique to tell you something interesting to or to promote the ongoing use of geothermal or you can be more general and work with integrating many different data types to better understand these geothermal systems so there's a lot of room for specialization but there's also a lot of room for um 
for a jack of no trade geologists as well and, and to be a multidisciplinary geologist in this field. Um, something that's uh, great news for the longevity of a career in geothermal is that geothermal systems are constantly changing and because they are sustainable and, and if they're managed well they will last um, well beyond the lifespan of many of us here. Um, these geothermal systems are constantly changing so there's always constant need for geoscientists to study them and analyze them and characterize them. Um, another thing as well is because uh, not every geothermal system is the same. There are some similarities between them, but there's a lot of variability as well. So there's a number of different interesting ways to apply your geoscience to this sector and um, to keep you interested for years and years to come. So it's a very vibrant um, area of, of the energy sector for geologists to contribute to, for, for earth scientists to get involved in. Um, and what I want to do next is sort of highlight a few of the areas that, um, that I believe um, are, and, and certainly I've used myself um, in uh, sort of getting involved as an earth scientist in, in the geothermal sector. Um, I actually uh, recently wrote um, a, a blog article for the, um, the blog, the Geoscience for the Future blog, um, which I'll just, I'll drop a link to it in the chat if you want to see more. Um, and this is basically, um, it was basically a blog that sort of summarizes what skills and, uh, and topics that did I get in my undergrad that I have found really useful to um, having an actual professional career as a geologist in geothermal. So, um, and that's kind of what I want to give you a flavor of now. So obviously um, the first one, multiple people, everyone will generally think of is field work. And I will say that I was quite surprised as um, when, I, when I left my, my undergrad and my PhD to start working as, as a professional geologist was how little I used the traditional field training that I'd been given, but how useful the overall uh, skill was um, when, I, when I did start using it. Um, I don't think um, once uh, in my sort of 11 or 12 years working, as a ge working in the geothermal energy sector have I had to lithology map, but I have had to do some very heavily detailed specific um, field studies, including everything from uh, trenching faults, which we'll talk about a little bit here, um, to just studying fracture patterns and outcrops and helping translate that into um, into different areas. So there's um, th there's a real use for your field skill talents. Um, you might have to think a little bit about how you adapt those to be more specific to the problems you're you're going to tackle. Um, because you're very, rare, you're very rarely going to be out there mapping the entire ge geology of a region, but you are going to use those skills in very specific ways. Um, one of my favorite new ways to work with my field skills um, when I started working in geothermal was with the this, um, activity around trenching active faults. So I was working in New Zealand at the time in the Telpo Volcanic Zone, which is an area of active rifting. It's a, it's a back arc rift. So it's got a lot of um, active seismicity because the, the normal faults are moving all the time. And, uh, we have a lot of active fault traces that run around, that run across the surface of the areas, and they run through a lot of the geothermal regions there. You know, the, the, the active rifting is why we have the geothermal systems in that place. And uh, what we would normally have to do is, um, for companies that were interested in developing, so say for example, infrastructure like a new power plant or new pipelines in the area, we would have to assess the likelihood or the risk of these um, faults that are in this region to um, to uh, damage um, th those infrastructures or their potential to cause um, future hazards. So we would uh, identify uh, fault traces that were in the path of planned infrastructure. We would get a digger and dig massive trenches across these. And then we would get in and you can see examples of, of, of some of the geoscientists I've worked with previously getting in. And we would map the, uh, so usually we're, this, the fault would be running something like this and we've dug across it perpendicular and we would be mapping all of the different offsets of layers across these faults and getting an idea of how frequently that fault moved over time. Um, when you're able to establish that recurrence interval of the fault, you're able to establish potentially how hazardous it's going to be or it's the likelihood that it's going to be, uh, that it's going to activate again and damage any infrastructure that you're building in the region around it. And this was a really interesting place to work in as a geologist in the energy sector because you had to work a lot with uh, engineers and site developers and planners, as well as architects as well. And one of the outcomes of one of the studies we did in this region was here we had, um, oh, sorry, my red line has created faults that aren't there, <laughs> but uh, we had uh, the fault map of a region before um, we did any mapping and trenching across the area. And this black box here was the planned, um, 
was the planned site for a new power station in this geothermal field. And you can see that they had decided to site it directly on a fault line, which they had assumed, which had been mapped years and years and years ago, which they assumed was quite inactive. But they wanted to uh, reinvestigate that before they invested millions into building this power station. So we came in as the geologists and we remapped uh, an, a bunch of the faults in the area and we trenched a couple of the ones that were nearby the proposed uh, power plant and we looked at their hazard potential going forward. And based on our information that we were able to provide on the new faults and that, they actually redesigned and relocated the entire footprint of the power station. So it's a really interesting place to be able to work as a geologist alongside people from vastly different fields to you, but all working towards the same goal. Of course, there's lots of other skills that get brought in. You know, mapping is sort of a little bit more modern now um, with all these new techniques we can bring in around remote sensing, aerial photography and LIDAR. And we can actually collect much, um, we can actually collect fault maps from very wide areas using these data sets. And this is an example here that, uh, of some data I worked with um, with colleagues in New Zealand, looking at the fault patterns and mapping the active fault patterns across um, large geothermal regions of, um, of the Taupo Volcanic Zone in the North Island, New Zealand. And all these red lines that we're able to map out here, and this is a, a zoom in of, of the, one of the caldera zones, you can see all of these detailed structural patterns. And again, important for understanding hazard risks associated with building geothermal uh, infrastructure, but also important for understanding the rifting uh, nature of this area, because that's ultimately what's controlling how the geothermal fluids are moving around in the crust. And we want to target those geothermal fluids to actually produce the energy. Speaking of that, a huge thing that I got involved in, and, and I'm sure many of you have seen me talk about um, some of this before, is uh, the uh, application of new technologies to geothermal wells to try and get more information on the structure. We know that structure is a huge component of how geothermal fluids migrate around in the crust and how they're stored, but we often struggle with getting that information directly out of this, the, the subsurface. Now, this is something that the oil and gas industry has been doing for decades. They've created and crafted all these fabulous tools that are able to go into wells and capture images of the inside of the well. The problem with, this, with being able to do similar things in geothermal until maybe the last 10 years or so has been the, uh, the technology limitations. You, know, you put some of these tools into a well that has 300 degrees centigrade temperatures in it, that tool's coming out as a piece of burnt toast, essentially. So we've had to work with engineers and, um, and all sorts of physicists around sonics and resistivity to craft tools that are actually capable of going into these really hot wells and collecting the information that we need to understand the geology that ultimately controls where these systems are and where the hot fluids are in the subsurface. And some of these tools were generated and ran for the very first time in New Zealand. And this is some of the work that, I'm, that I got to work on when I was over there uh, as a, working as a, a structural geologist for geothermal. And what we were doing was using these uh, tools to capture uh, uh, acoustic images of the inside of the well, and then using that to look at the fracture patterns and the fracture uh, networks and the orientations of those networks in different parts of the rift in different geothermal fields. So I think um, over the years, we measured something like uh, nearly 13 or 14,000 fractures. And what we're able to see is there are some trends that are common to the geothermal field, like they all have more or less the same strike orientations, but dip directions vary very drastically from field to field as you move along. And again, that's really important information for geothermal field planners and developers to understand because that affects all sorts of things like where you're going to site your well and what direction you're going to drill your well in if you want it to be as successful as possible. Ultimately, the goal of doing something like this is really to help companies drill less wells, which is more economic for them, and also means they get more uh, efficient wells. So again, you're helping their bottom line. But at the same time, you're also helping, helping them to drill less wells, which ultimately is more environmental because that has a much lower um, surface impact on the, on the surface environment around these drill sites. So there's, so there's some great reasons to be able to do this kind of information and great impacts from providing it. Uh, there's also been some great collaborations between geothermal geologists and uh, uh, software designers as well. So uh, something that we really needed in the geothermal sector um, and it, that's been developing really over the last 15 years or so is modeling software that is very good at actually modeling the complex geology of, you know, of uh, igneous and volcanic subsurfaces. So, you know, we're, we're not dealing here with um, nice 
and I'm not saying oil and gas is by any means um, simple in comparison. It can be very complex too, uh, in terms of sedimentary basin settings. But here we're dealing with uh, volcanic clastic layering. We're dealing with interesting topography. And we're also dealing with oddly shaped intrusive bodies, dikes forms, sill intrusions. You're dealing with interesting morphological ge geology in the subsurface and being able to have software that can accurately represent that based on sometimes quite limited information. So it might just be the geology from the well data and being able to then also build structure into these models as well. So you're accurately representing what the subsurface is like and what it's doing is quite a challenge. And something that was a really enjoyable um, uh, enjoyable task to do was work with actual software designers about what we needed as geologists to be able to accurately model the 3D geology in the subsurface and explain to them uh, explain to them the geology that we needed to represent and then listen to them about how that was best tackled through coding, for example. So lots of really interesting places that cross that interdisciplinary area of geoscientist and computer science and, um, and software engineer. So really, really nice interdisciplinary boundaries to work at. Also, if you're into geophysics and not so much of a, uh, of a, of a, uh, a I hate saying geologist because geophysics, in my opinion, is just geology. <laughs> but if you're more into the geophysics side of geology, um, there's amazing places to work in geothermal as well. And again, it's all about how we replicate the successes we've had with other, uh, with using geophysics to characterize other resources like oil and gas, for example, or, uh, or groundwater or even mining, how do we replicate those with geothermal and how do we adapt these geophysical techniques to tell us more about what we need to understand? So for example, how do I design the uh, geophysical sensors and how do I deploy them best uh, around um, a potential uh, green site to actually characterize where my geothermal fluids are in the subsurface because that's the information you need to successfully plan, design and build a, a geothermal power, uh, uh, power source. So uh, one of the um, interesting things that's been developing over the last 20 years is the sort of uh, growth of magnetotellurics as a way of characterizing where uh, subsurface fluids exist, not just at shallow depths, but also trying to understand. And if you see, this is um, these are two cross sections, uh, magnetotelluric uh, model cross sections through part of um, the, the geothermal system in New Zealand. What you can see is here's the upper few kilometers where most of our geothermal resources sit. And these are these kind of brighter uh, red and yellow spots that are sitting here. But what we're able to do with magnetotellurics, again, depending on how we deploy those systems, is actually get an insight into the deeper plumbing systems of these geothermal fluids. Where are the hot fluids coming from, from depth? Is it, uh, or are they just circulating around as part of um, a convection system involving rainfall? Um, and what we're able to see is actual oriented pathways where magmatic fluids might be channeled up towards our geothermal systems in the shallow subsurface. And being able to use these new types of geophysical tools and, 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 and ways of representing that geophysical information is really important. We're even seeing this with um, the increased use of micro seismic um, detection in geothermal fields. So we're able to deploy very um, dense uh, arrays of seismic, uh, of seismic detectors that are quite sensitive to um, small earthquakes and uh, locate those earthquakes in three dimensions to help us uh, look at, to help us look at how we can identify large scale structures that might be active. And if they're active, they might be open. And if they're open, they might be channeling fluids. And we can start to see that we're getting really deep structures. This is five kilometers depth. We're getting really deep, active, brittle deformation occurring along potentially large scale faults that might be part of those uh, magmatic fluid uh, channeling systems feeding our geothermal systems from depth. So a lot of really interesting geophysical developments happening there. So if you're into geophysics, there's a great place for you in geothermal. A lot of this, um, again, coming back to this idea of linking up uh, geologists and geophysics uh, to, um, to uh, modeling and to, uh, software design, another huge growth area in this field has been around reservoir modeling. Um, and that includes how do we collect the right sort of geological information that we need to parameterize our numerical models to understand better how fluids move and where the hot fluids are and where the cold fluids are in these systems. But we've also had to get a lot more clever with our numerical model, uh, the physics that embed embedded within these numerical flow models themselves, understanding things like supercritical fluids and how do they move and how do they um, interact with the subsurface, dual phase fluids, because we're dealing with both water and gases as well. And again, we're taking lessons learned from uh, the, the kind of reservoir modeling that's been done in other uh, resource systems and adapting it and modifying it to better suit the, um, the different conditions that we, exp they, we experience in geothermal systems. So there's a great space for this to happen here. 
And when you can do this, you can start to do some really exciting um, modeling things that really help um, grow geothermal in different areas. So this is an example from um, a paper here, Siler et al. This is some work I did with uh, some US geologists who were developing a um, greenfield geosystem in uh, the uh, near uh, Great Lake Pyramid in Nevada. And they had a couple of exploratory wells with some data from them, some images of the fractures, some stress orientations. They had a fault map and they had some uh, seismic uh, surveys across the area as well. And with the data they had, they wanted to build essentially a 3D model that would help them understand where the fluids are most likely being uh, transmitted around or circulating. And using basically using uh, models that look at how faults slip and move, um, because that might indicate areas of fluid transmission, mapping that out in full three dimensions across an area, taking all the well data and populating and parameterizing this model to identify essentially a sweet spot model that would help uh, drillers target um, spots that would be more productive for actually ge generating um, geothermal energy from this. So there's lots and lots of interactivity between lots of different types of geoscientists and lots of different types of scientists in general. So, from all of that, hopefully you get a sense of um, the fact that there is really a place for um, any type of earth scientists and geoscientists in the space. And I didn't even cover a lot of other things. You know, if you're into geomicrobiology, huge growth sector in terms of, um, of geothermal, not only from the uh, aspect of understanding how, that, uh, how those microbes and geothermal systems help precipitate out interesting minerals that might be of economic importance, but also what we're seeing with a lot of the mic geomicrobiology research in geothermal is we're discovering um, representatives of some of the earliest, um, uh, earliest uh, forms of microbial and, and, uh, and life, um, which is really interesting as well. So there's a paleo and life science element to geothermal as well, if you're interested in that side of things. Um, obviously, I'm a structural geologist and a mineralogist uh, at times, and my major interest in geothermal sort of focuses on this. And I was really interested in fractures. And in general, that's kind of what I'm, I'm interested in uh, full stop is, uh, is how structure and fluid interact with each other in the subsurface to impact things like uh, resources such as geothermal systems or even earthquakes. And uh, so I got really into the study and characterization of fracture networks and geothermal systems um, all over the world, but mostly with a focus in New Zealand and being able to characterize those and understand how they, how they transmit fluid. And what I discovered is as I started um, working closely with industries particularly was that they, while they understood the importance of the structures and characterizing the networks to geothermal fluid flow, they also had this problem where uh, as the fluids move through the geothermal systems, they start to uh, close up those fluid flow pathways and um, because the fluids interact with the rocks and when the geothermal fluids interact with the rocks, they nucleate and grow new uh, minerals on the surface. So essentially they seal up the fractures over time and those fluid flow pathways that you've been using to feed your well, which and then feed water up to the power station to generate power, essentially become closed off with use and with time. So again, it brings me back to this idea that geothermal uh, energy resources are sustainable and need to be managed in a way that keeps them producing power. So something I got very interested in was this concept of fracture sealing. And this is kind of my uh, focus of my research at the minute. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in detail now. Um, and I'm really interested in understanding mineralogical processes that occur inside these geothermal systems because we actually don't know a lot about them. And because we don't know a lot about them, it's a real struggle to come up with ways of mitigating and managing the impacts of this process. So we have geothermal fluids traveling through open fractures and we're getting nucleation of uh, new mineral material, either at the fracture walls and sometimes even within the fluid itself. And I'll talk more about that later on. As this happens, we get new minerals uh, forming, uh, nucleating and growing into the fracture. And then essentially over time, completely closing that fracture up. And it's now no longer contributing geothermal fluid input into your well. And this is the problem. So we need to understand what processes control nucleation and what processes control growth because if we can understand those, we can come up with ways of limiting it from happening if we want to. So this is really, the concept of this mineral nucleation growth is really similar to the same sort of things around, for example, scaling of your uh, elements in your dishwasher or your kettle, for example. And it's actually a, a really interesting phenomenon just geologically anyway, because it occurs in multiple systems. This is essentially the processes that govern the formation of geological veins. However, it is of economic importance, particularly to um, a lot of systems that are engaged and are becoming a lot more important for things like the 
energy transition. So for example, uh, a lot of ore body systems are fractured and a lot of the fractured minerals within those ore bodies often are associated with economic minerals that we need to mine a lot more of for green technology manufacturing, for example. So the materials we need for solar panels, uh, wind, um, wind turbines, batteries uh, for electric vehicles, for example. The processes of fracture sealing and vein formation are really important for that. And here you can see this is just a, a, a quartz vein running through a granite body in Western Ireland associated with the deposition of molybdenite. And again, an important element that we need for metals that we need for manufacturing. Um, it's also really uh, a really important process for some new potentially growing um, sectors around carbon storage. So by injecting uh, CO2 into the subsurface, we can encourage it to interact with certain rock types and the CO2 then becomes, uh, is stripped out of the fluids and captured in mineral form as, uh, as carbonate minerals. And this is a permanent way of storing, of taking CO2, of capturing it at, at point sources, injecting it into the ground and storing it there permanently. So this, again, it's just fluid rock interaction. It's closing up open spaces in the subsurface by injecting fluids into them. Uh, and it's a process that we need to understand uh, the atomic uh, mechanisms of in a lot more detail. When I started discussing this with geothermal um, field operators and geothermal um, plant operators, I also discovered that this is a huge material science issue for them as well, because not only are they getting their fracture networks uh, gummed up with new mineral growth, but their pipes experience it as well. So this is the original diameter of one of the pipes that transmits their geothermal fluids from well to power station. And over time, as those fluids have moved through that pipe, they have scaled up with silica and quartz and reduce the diameter and thus the efficiency of that pipe and those need to be constantly replaced so there's even material scientists interested in understanding what's happening at the surface here that allows this to happen and what about what can we change about the way we let the fluids run through that to try and prevent it from happening so we don't have to replace these pipes so much so it's a really interesting space for mineralogists and material scientists to get engaged with in the geothermal sector in terms of the fracture sealing, we even see this from all sorts of well data and samples. We can see examples of it on, um, on borehole images that we capture. We get these uh, new high resistive zones around fractures al along the borehole that show us that mineralization is happening there. Uh, we can look at, uh, at drill core and we can see minerals forming and completely closing up individual structures. And we can look at that in thin section as well. We can see mineral growth in the fractures itself but, uh, and growth of minerals that we know precipitate from geothermal fluids too. So we see this from we see this occurring in a lot of geothermal systems from all over. We did a little pilot study to try and see if we could use some very typically applied uh, analysis techniques from mineralogy. And we've been using these techniques in geoscience for ages. I actually did my PhD with these techniques. And we thought let's try and apply these techniques and see if they tell us something useful about how and why um, this mineral scaling is occurring. So we did a pilot study and on the uh, some fracture sealed fractures and the Cairo geothermal field in New Zealand and this is just a picture of the of the field itself next to Mount Puduaki over here and uh, we decided we would study some calcite um, growth that was occurring in these systems in particular I'm going to focus on some data we collected on this region here so this is a large open fracture more than a millimeter or so across that has been sealed up with these blades of calcite here, which are often up to um, a millimeter to two millimeters in length. So we have this interesting morphology of calcite mineralization happening in these geothermal structures. So the first thing we did was get some chemical mapping done of them because we wanted to understand how the if, if there was any zoning and if that zoning would tell us about how these individual calcite crystals grew over time. So when we look at some of the individual crystals from the sea elm, and this is just done through some simple photoluminescence, the same as if you've ever done any of it in um, uh, in the in the University of Liverpool, it's just that microscope that we use over in the uh, the teaching centre and uh, the teaching uh, hub, and uh, it basically shows us maps of different chemical zones within calcite blades. And the different orange and red colors are basically telling us whether the calcite has higher levels of manganese or higher levels of iron. And what we see is we get these really interesting chemical pa zonation patterns that are asymmetrically concentric. And what that basically means is these calcite blades are growing fast in one direction and slower in another direction. And that the growth based on the observations of these patterns is actually starting from the center of each of these individual crystals themselves. So what we see is initially um, 
a lower iron manganese content calcite forming, which is then followed by this rim of sort of darker red calcite, which has got a higher amount of iron in it. And we know that that's actually a little bit slower because not only are those zones a lot thinner, but whenever you precipitate iron rich calcite, the growth of that uh, particular calcite type is a lot slower in general anyway. So now we're starting to get a bit of an insight into how quickly this type of calcite precipitation can seal up these fluid flow fractures in the geothermal system. They have periods of rapid and periods of slow growth. And then following that slower growth, we just had continued growth of uh, more of the orange colored calcite happening to fill up all the spaces. But it implies that for a period of time, there was calcite blades growing in a sort of interconnected way, nearly forming a scaffold inside this vein, allowing for a period of time fluid to move around in the spaces between. So there's even an implication here that this type of precipitation and this type of mineral scaling in our geothermal systems actually keeps fractures open for longer, allowing fluid to move through for longer periods of time. So it might actually be beneficial, not just detrimental to the system. We also did some crystallographic mapping of them. So we used techni a technique that's very popular at the University of Liverpool called electron backscatter diffraction. And we basically are mapping the orientation of the crystal lattice of these calcite crystals. And what we found when we created a map of these calcite blades is that most of them have their, um, their M axes aligned parallel to the fracture wall and the C axes aligned perpendicular. And we know now that the, and we know that the fast growth direction is along the length so these are growing very fast in the M axis directions, which is interesting for calcite because normally calcite, especially cal vein calcite, tends to grow um, longer perpendicular to the C axis. So what we actually have developing in these geothermal systems is what is called length slow calcite. And again, that's an interesting thing to think about in terms of how quickly is this scaling happening because length slow calcite is thought to be slower, a slower form of calcite that grows, uh, sorry, a form of calcite that grows more slowly with time as opposed to uh, length fast calcite, which is calcite growing, perpendicular, uh, growing long in the C axis. So again, just observations like this that we've never had before because we've never applied these techniques to these systems is giving us insights into potentially calcite scaling rates in fractured reservoirs and geothermal systems. We can even go into higher levels of detail on this to, to look at a bit more. When we look at each individual calcite crystal, we can see that there's a subtle uh, distortion to the orientation of the calcite crystals along their length. So if we start at one point here, and we measure the crystallographic orientation consistent, uh, con consistently along the length of this calcite blade, we see that the orientation changes from uh, changes up to 10 degrees from one side to the other. But what is important to observe about that is this change isn't happening because we're getting subgrain development or kinks in the, in the crystal lattice creating subgrain walls. This is just a gradual distortion of the crystal lattice along its length. There's a couple of reasons why that might be, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But what we did is we decided to analyze that orientation, that crystallographic orientation data a little more and do some more clever analysis with it. So we took individual maps of the blades of calcite and we plotted, their inf plotted the orientation information up so we could understand how the distortion in the lattice was rotating around a particular crystal, uh, crystal axis. and um, what crystal plane that that rotation might be happening in. So we, we use some very clever um, crystallographic data analysis techniques to do that. Basically what it helps us analyze is potential slip systems, which are, which are essentially just deformation mechanisms that allow crystals to crystal lattices to deform. We're able to identify possible slip systems that are creating that distortion. And what's interesting about calcite is different deformation mechanisms, different slip systems operate at different temperatures. So if we can identify the deformation mechanism, we might be able to use this as a tool to actually fingerprint different temperatures that were different temperatures that this geothermal system experienced over time. So we're actually getting some insight into the temperature evolution of these systems. Again, something that's very important for us to understand because it helps us understand the sustainability and longevity of this as a resource. So that was the deformation reason for why we see these lattice distortions. And again, the idea here is that being able to do that might actually create a new geothermal um, geology tool for us to use that would be of interest to industry development of these systems. The other process is those lattice distortions can actually occur by crystal growth as well. Um, now, the, 
the cause of if it is growth, the cause of that is because the calcite is growing from low levels of supersaturation in the fluids. So it's low. It's got a low level of supersaturation in cal, uh, of calcium in the fluid. If that is the case, and again, we're still debating on which of these processes is happening or if both of them are happening. But if it's the growth case, then again, maybe we don't have a tool that's telling us about temperature of these systems over time. We have a tool that's telling us about the chemical composition of our geothermal fluids as they circulate around our systems. Again, something that's incredibly important to understand from an industry perspective, because understanding chemical compositions of our fluids is important for understanding what type of infrastructure we need to manage that. We also are generating some new and interesting insights. I mentioned before that as you flow through a fracture, sometimes nucleation happens at the wall, sometimes it happens in the fluid. The fact that we could identify that these calcite blades were growing from the centers of their crystals outward in all directions implies that we don't have nucleation at a fracture wall, which is what we normally sort of expect in, in, in fracture sealing and in vein formation. It actually suggests that the nucleation of these systems might be occurring in the fluid themselves. And it's what we call homogeneous crystallization. And this might be what we're looking, this might be some evidence we're looking at for this occurring in a geological system. Now, if this is what's happening, this requires the presence of what we call little nano clusters of, of the material that float around in the fluid. And they provide the basic building blocks then for mineral process, uh, mineralization growth processes to occur eventually growing these blades. And if this is a process, this homogeneous crystallization, if this is a process that's happening in geothermal systems, that might have really important implications for how fluid moves through these systems and for how scaling um, occurs. We also see this a more standard nucleation, the heterogeneous, heterogeneous nucleation where the crystals nucleate and grow the fracture walls. But again, we've had some more study on this and a PhD student of mine, Ashton Scully, has been working on this. They're finding that the nucleation in this type of way is actually being controlled by very specific mineral types and orientations of those minerals at the fracture wall. So there are very specific controls occurring that we didn't know about before. And again, if we know what those controls are, maybe we can come up with ways of limiting their impact. So I'll just finish with some final thoughts that I'm sure a number of you are familiar with me saying before. But I just want to say here that geothermal is a really fast growing international industry, and I think there is a lot of potential for it to grow here at home in the UK. These geothermal resources require very detailed geological characterization at multiple scales and across multiple disciplines to understand how they operate and how we can utilize them best. And we, as an earth science and geological community, have already got a wealth of experience and a bunch of established techniques that can help with this. We just have to start thinking about how to adapt and apply them to, uh, to the geothermal uh, sector. And because of that, there's room for everyone in this field. And I mean that with respect to uh, whatever geological or earth science discipline you're coming from, but also there's room for everyone, no matter your background, no matter your uh, walk of life in this field as well. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit more in a second. Um, there's lots of room for innovative thinking and, and for adapting all these existing techniques. And there's plenty of opportunity for you to get out there and be innovative and create new ones. So I highly encourage people to think about geothermal as a potential place to apply your geological uh, training and develop your geological career. Uh, just to finalize, uh, final, finalize something I was saying there, there is room for everyone in, um, in the geosciences and there is room for everyone in geothermal particularly. Um, and there are lots of different groups you can engage with that are very um, good at uh, promoting the voices of a, a diverse range of geoscientists in these fields to give you examples of people who might be like you who are already in that space. And they're also really good groups to engage with because they're actively working to identify and remove any barriers that might be existing there to that enable anybody to be able to engage with these um, with this with the geothermal sector or with any geoscience sector as well. So if you are interested in getting involved, no matter who you are, please look up some of these groups and get involved with them. They do really good work. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope I haven't overran my time too much and I hope that was enjoyable and useful to everybody. And again, thank you very much for having me. It's been a real honor. Thanks Dave, that was a really good talk. Um, so it, it's been really good to actually see how we can influence future changes in the energy sector. Like, I know that there's been quite a lot on the Discord happening, so oh, okay. um, <laughs> you've, you've caused quite a stir. Okay. <laughs> so we only have time for a couple of questions before our next break, but if you're all right to go into the Discord during the break or throughout the rest of the session, keep I'll it be hanging on now. for a little while to have chats with people, so that's totally fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the first question is, you talked in some depth about the United Downs project, 
What must they achieve to prove the UK geothermal industrial development is feasible? And what do you think the time scale of this will be from a career and investment perspective? Oof, that's a great question. Um, I wish I knew more and went into more depth about that particular project. Um, I've only been able to go and visit it a couple of times as, a, as an interested um, expert in the field. But um, they, So where they're at now actually is quite interesting because they've just finished, I believe, their first set of um, flow testing of the wells that they drilled into their resource to try and get it to work. So now they have I think collected the first um, the first part of the data sets that they need to show that this is actually a real workable system and that it can generate the power they said it can. So we're kind of at a very exciting stage with that project, I think, about it about determining whether or not this is going to be a proof a proof of concept. My hope is that it will be, and I think the noises that are coming from that sector are uh, coming from the people that work in that area are very positive at the minute. So the idea here is if this if they can prove that it works down there. Why can't it work elsewhere in similar types of systems across the UK or even globally, to be honest? So I'm hoping that this sets up um, basically the growth of this type of development of, of resource um, of, re of resource of resource development across the UK if it works. Uh, I think in terms of timescales, um, in terms of them being able to do that, I think we might be looking at maybe another year or so while they get the system up and running. Um, hopefully, I'm not sure what their, their goals are, but I would imagine um, producing power from this system um, as soon as possible is quite high up on their list of things to achieve. So I would imagine we're looking at maybe another year of testing and making sure that the system is uh, operating efficiently and also that it's operating safely. Um, you know, you're, you're injecting fluids into the ground, you're creating seismicity, you wanna make sure you're not creating too much of it and that the people that live in the region aren't being uh, too affected, you know, either uh, physically or mentally by that seismicity as well. So there's lots of things they have to consider while they work on this. Um, in terms of investment, it's a great question. Um, certainly, I think one of the more limiting factors to the growth of geothermal in the UK specifically, and again, I've only been kind of delving into UK geothermal the last year or so, it just seems to be a lack of encouragement and investment from government in the development of this as a resource, although it has been highlighted as an area um, that can help contribute to decarbonization of particularly the uh, our heat energy in the UK. And it's part of the uh, UK's recently announced plans for um, achieving net zero by 2050. So hopefully what we're going to see now is a much um, bigger amount of, uh, a bigger push from, from government and from funding bodies to encourage geoscientists for a start to start getting out there and collecting this information and doing research about these geothermal systems in the UK, but also hopefully they'll start incentivizing development companies coming in, drilling companies coming in and start uh, and, and helping them get this, uh, get these systems set up as, as economic kind of um, workable systems, hopefully. Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more quick question from Discord. And it says, um, do you think that once depleted oil platforms could be converted into off offshore geothermal power stations, or are they too small or costly to convert cost effectively? Um, I, that's a, a really good question again. Um, to, yeah. Theoretically, yes. Um, but I think there are a number of potential issues with it. One being that um, how do we get the hot fluids from uh, an offshore place to, how do we pipe that to a power station somewhere nearby or do we generate the power and wire it to uh, offshore, from offshore to onshore? There, there are issues around the uh, development of the extra infrastructure we would need. However, your huge benefit is you've already drilled your wells, which is probably the most expensive part of any of these setups. Um, although saying that some of these wells are quite old and may not be suitable or may not have been drilled um, to the right standards that we would drill by modernly um, to be allowed to be used for these kind of things. So it, there are certain, there are lots of different workable elements in that that need to be considered. But I think it's something that we should certainly be looking into as as potential arm of this of this geothermal development. We certainly have plenty of offshore wells that we've been drilling for decades. There's just one more time, time for one more, sorry. Um, there's one actually in the Zoom, and it's how do crystals which nucleate within the fluid remain in place to grow rather than moving with fluid flow? When I find out, I will let you know. <laughs> it, no, it's honestly, that's a fantastic question. And it's something that's been plaguing me recently as well. Uh, this, this concept of, um, of homogenous nucleation of crystals, um, it's very 
popular in the materials science space because they look at it a lot as a as a mechanism that occurs when you know you're, you're when steel is cooling and crystallizing from its molten uh, perspective so ag again i think part of it will come down to how fast does that initial growth occur by and whether you know and if kind of grow fast enough to basically so when you looked at those maps that i was showing you of the crystals they were in three and we've done we've looked at them in three dimensions as well not just as 2d these blades are interlocking like this creating that scaffold so if you have a bunch of floating nanoclusters, for example, potentially acting as these nucleation sites, and then something happens to the fluids or the conditions that the system is under, and all of a sudden precipitation starts going uh, very fast, the precipitation of, min of and growth of the minerals occurs really quickly, they might grow so fast that they just lock themselves in place, and then slower growth can continue on top of that. However, we're not going to be able to uh, figure that out yet, but we are planning some really interesting research that might help with that. Um, one of our newer PhD students here at Liverpool, um, Mahesh Kajendran, is going to be performing a series of experiments that look at how precipitation occurs um, in geothermal type conditions um, using some lab experiments. So watch the space. That's brilliant. Thank you, Dev. Um, Thank you very so much. Um, everyone can go back into the Discord if you'd like to. Um, we're going to take a longer break now until 10 to 5. Um, there'll be a five minute reminder posted in the Zoom chat and on the Discord again when we'll reconvene, so we'll see you then.